Everything's bigger in Texas, including the fight for voting rights. Beto O'Rourke is here to discuss democracy in the Lone Star State. Welcome back to Defending Democracy. I'm Mark Elias. Let's get started. Welcome, Congressman O'Rourke, to Defending Democracy. Hey, Mark, it's great to be with you. I'm a big fan of your work, love everything that you're doing, and really appreciate the fact that there are good people out there fighting literally on on every single front, because that's what I think it's going to take. So it's an honor to be with you. Well, thank you uh, for those kind words. So you served six years in Congress. Uh, You uh, uh, ran for Senate and governor and president, and you've always been a passionate supporter of voting rights. And of course, you are from the state of Texas. So what should people who are not from Texas make of democracy in Texas? Because we it makes the national news, but it's always sort of hard to figure it out. Yeah, I think Texas has a, a really special story within the larger history of American democracy. Um, to go back a little bit in, in time, at the end of Reconstruction, Throughout the state of Texas in the 1880s, you still had a very high number of African-American Texans who were in these positions of public trust, elected office across the state. And in fact, in I think it was 1888, um, half of the elected officials in in Fort Bend County, which is just outside of, of Harris County and Houston, were black. But there was a white nationalist anti democracy group known as the Jaybirds in in Texas, who fought against pluralism, who fought against democracy, and who especially fought against African-American office holders. But when Texas Governor Sol Ross rode to the quote unquote rescue, the peace that he imposed on Fort Bend County was essentially to eject every African-American office holder and to institute the Jaybird primary that was not struck down by the United States Supreme Court until 1954. It it all culminated in a federal elections bill that was introduced in 1890 that would have ensured that everyone, including African-Americans in Texas and Mississippi and Louisiana and Georgia and Alabama, would have equal access to the ballot box, the pro-democracy party at the time. They passed this in the House. It got hung up on the horns of a filibuster in the Senate and the Republican president who had campaigned on a promise of restoring voting rights essentially looked the other way. And we lost the last best hope for democracy and full voting rights for 75 years until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But to put a point on this story, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was only possible really because of Texas. You know, voting rights heroes like Lawrence Aaron Nixon, who helped to integrate elections and defeat the white primary law in Texas, and the first president from Texas, LBJ, who used all the political muscle he had to help create the first true multiracial democracy in American history. So all of that is precedent to the moment that we're in right now, which post Shelby versus Holder, 11 years and counting, you have the single greatest attack on voting rights and democracy anywhere in America, right here in Texas, where it is tougher to vote, harder to register to vote than it is anywhere else in the country. In almost every single legislative session, we meet every odd year here in Texas, it gets worse and worse. Um, One of the most egregious, obscene anti-democracy bills, SB1, which I know you're very familiar with, passed in 2021, challenged in the courts almost immediately after, produced incredible uh, results in so far as it almost completely eroded trust in voting and democracy in Texas. 12% of the mail-in ballots, for example, cast in the 2022 primary were rejected. That is tens of thousands of voters who tried to work through this onerous Byzantine labyrinth of voting laws in order to register their vote and have their voice heard were told that it just didn't matter and it didn't count. And that contributed certainly to more than 9 million registered Texans who did not cast a ballot in the most important governor's race 
certainly in, in modern history, where you had the Uvalde mass shooting on the ballot, you had a total abortion ban on the ballot, you had our state's inability literally to keep the power on and the heat running during one of the worst winter storms in 2021, that was on the ballot, healthcare on the ballot, minimum wage on the ballot. It's not that those 9 million people didn't care about these issues and didn't wanna see positive change in Texas. It's just that when you have made it so hard for people to vote, it shouldn't surprise us when they don't. So, so that's where we are right now. And, and last thing on, on the answer to your question about Texas, you know, I mentioned 1890 being this last great hope for American democracy post reconstruction, and we blew it for 75 years, 75 years of darkness, of Jim Crow, of something far less than a democracy, especially in the states of the former Confederacy. I think we're at a similar moment right now and, and either we regain this democracy following the lead of you and others who are on the front lines of this fight, or we might very well lose it for another 75 years, or we might very well lose it forever. And, and much in the same way that Texas was central to those fights in the 1880s, 1890s, and certainly in the 1960s, I think Texas will be central to this fight again in 2024 and beyond. So, you know, there's no question it is harder to vote in Texas than it is in most in most states. Um, you know, uh, the the numbers you gave are extraordinary uh, about what it has meant for for voters. Um, and it sounds like you fundamentally agree with my my prescription for success, which is that we need Congress to pass federal voting rights legislation. Short of that, you know, the biggest question I get from people and I'm sure you get this question all the time is like, what can they do? You know, like what can people do? Like if you're, if you're, if you're living in Texas in this reality, like what are, what can you do on the ground in Texas? Or for that matter, if you're not in Texas and you want to help, like what are the things that people can do? Because they look at Congress and they're like, well, you know, maybe, maybe we get a bill, but we probably don't get one, you know, immediately. There's some really interesting echoes of this history that I laid out earlier taking place right now. So I mentioned that that last great hope of, of 1890. In 2021, we had the pro-democracy party, the Democrats, we had a majority in the House, a majority in the Senate. We had a president who ran in part on restoring voting rights to those who had had them stripped since the Shelby versus Holder decision. We had the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. We had For the People Act. We had no shortage of pro-democracy voting rights restoration bills that were out there, some of which were able to pass the Democratic controlled House, but again, faltered on the threat of a filibuster in the Senate. And for whatever reason, our party, though we held uh, every lever of power, no matter how tenuous we still had them, we were unable to come up with the victory. So that takes me to the next lesson that I learned from history, which is 1965. You know, not only did you have LBJ willing to use his political capital for you know, civil rights in 64, voting rights in 65. But you had folks like you and me, everyday Americans, who were taking to the courthouse steps, who were writing their members of Congress, who were lighting up the switchboard at the White House. Uh, you had John Lewis, 24 years old, leading a voting rights march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, literally taking his life in his hands, almost losing it in the process. And in so doing, inspiring LBJ and really the country, eight days after Bloody Sunday, LBJ has convened a joint session of Congress, every member of the House and the Senate. And he says, look, John Lewis is no different than those guys at Concord and Lexington, than those who won that victory against slavery at Appomattox in 1865. This guy and others like him were willing to lay down their lives so that we could realize the promise first set down in our foundational documents as a new country, as a democracy. And you, the members of the House and the Senate, you have the power to confer this right that they are asking for, the, the right to vote. My, my takeaway from that is that sometimes the legislative process doesn't work. It didn't work in 1890. We couldn't rely on those purportedly pro-democracy Republicans to do the right thing, just like for whatever reason, Democrats didn't fully come through for us in 2021 on restoring voting rights. So what do we do? This is your question. I think the power then comes back to the people and John Lewis and Septima Clark and Bob Moses and so many others of that 1950s and 1960s voting rights era who produced 
one of the greatest victories in American democracy or just democracy for this planet ever realized. They did it by connecting with one another across the country and mutually inspiring each other and being in the fight and realizing, look, we don't know if or, or when we are going to win, but we know we've got to try. We're not going to give up. We're not going to wait for the cavalry to ride to our rescue. We're not going to hope that someone else is going to figure this out for us. We're going to go out there and, and do it. And that's really what is so inspiring to me about the work that you're doing. It's so inspiring to me about the work that I see volunteers across the state of Texas doing who are registering voters in a state that makes it incredibly hard. No, no automatic voter registration, no same day voter registration. There's no even online voter registration. You have to go down to the county courthouse in many instances and meet personally with the voter registrar. If you want to volunteer to get people on the rolls, you got to go get certified, take a test, be approved, follow a very prescriptive system that is intended to scare people off from even doing this work in the first place. And so those volunteers who nonetheless get out there and brave the 105, 107 degree heat in El Paso to go meet young, eligible, pro-democracy future voters, get them on the rolls, stay in touch with them, help them through this process so that they can actually cast that ballot and make a difference, that is ultimately how we're going to win. Look, I hope the president, um, Democrats who are in positions of power, regain these majorities, are able to push these pieces of legislation through. But we know that they need our help. When, when Johnson met with Dr. King and Andrew Young, when they pled with him to use all of the power of the presidency to move forward on voting rights, he is alleged to have said to them, look, I want to help you. You're absolutely right about this, but I used all the muscle I had on civil rights. Gentlemen, I just don't have the power. And as they left the White House, King turned to Young and said, we got to go out there and get this president some power. I think that's your job and my job right now. Everyone who's watching this, that, that is our job. We got to go get the president the power he needs, the popular will that he can convert into legislation that then protects our democracy now that it is on the precipice of being lost literally forever. No hyperbole. Those are the stakes right now. And that's why we have to all be in this fight. If you're in Texas, you can join us. We have a group called Powered by People. We will train you for your volunteer deputy registrar certification process. We'll put you to work. We'll connect you with other volunteers and we'll help you add new voters to the rolls who might be the pro-democracy margin in close state house, congressional, U.S. Senate, and even presidential elections right here in Texas. Yeah, we're going to put a link uh, to to that to your organization in the show notes for folks. But I want to I want to have you go back to one thing you said because I think for people in the forty nine states and the District of Columbia that are not Texas, uh, it is it it is um, astounding. <laughs> that that to be clear, it, in order to register someone to vote in the state of Texas, you actually need to be like certified, right? Like like I can't just go out and I couldn't just like take a trip to Texas and get some forms and register people to vote. You understand? You do realize that's crazy, right? <laughs> it, it is. W welcome to Texas. I mean, this is the state that has closed more than seven hundred polling places, twice the number of the next closest state. Almost all of those polling place closures in the fastest growing black and brown neighborhoods. This is a state whose congressional districts were described by a three judge federal panel as a racial gerrymander. This is the state, as you are well aware, that had one drop off box per county, including counties like Harris, that has more people in it than the entire state of Nevada. This is also the state with 254 counties. And if you want to register somebody, you have to go get certified in that county, typically at the county courthouse with the county clerk, or if they have a voter registration office with the administrator there, you have to take a test, you have to be certified. Then you have to follow a, a very prescriptive set of procedures to register that voter, including, for example, turning in that registration form within five days, not five business days, just five days. If you don't, there are severe criminal penalties, again, intended to scare you from even doing this work. And certainly to your point 
Uh, they're not interested in do-gooders coming in from other states to help register people, the millions of people, by the way, who are not yet on the rolls in the state of Texas, so that they, so that we all could make a difference. And I'll tell you why this is happening. Um, you can probably guess, but if you look at 2012, when Barack Obama was running for re-election, he lost his state by 16 points. When Hillary Clinton runs four years later, she loses by only a little over nine points. Joe Biden, four years ago, lost Texas by 5.4%. Mm -hmm. So 16 to nine wow. to 5.4. The DNC didn't spend a dime in this state. None of those candidates spent a moment campaigning in this state. That is the natural tendency and trajectory of the electorate in Texas. That is why the Republican majority in the state House, state Senate, Republican office holders from the governor on down are doing everything they can to make it as impossible as they can for the rising majority in the state of Texas to have their will recorded at the ballot box and, and in these elections. And it's why we've got to fight back with everything we've got. They are the dead enders. They're, they're cornered. There is no room for growth for them. They know it's a matter of time. We know it is a matter of effort. The more of us who put in that effort uh, and, and with everything we've got in these remaining four months, the more likely we are to get there sooner rather than later. So one of the reasons why I really wanted to have you on uh, to talk about this is because you have uh, really a unique perch in many respects uh, on this challenge. You were in Congress for six years, so you have a good sense of what makes not just the Democrats in Congress tick, but what makes the Republicans in, tick, uh, in Congress tick. You're from a state, as you point out, that is that is undergoing that demographic and therefore some partisan shift. And, and this is, to me, a critical uh, piece of this. You're also in a state where, frankly, Republicans did try and actually achieve some success in appealing across those lines, right? It was George uh, uh, George Bush the second, the second president who was governor of Texas, who you know made a real outreach to the that emerging electorate and tried to be make the Republican Party more um, in, inclusive or at least welcoming in some respects. And so I, you know, I suspect when you got to Congress, there were Republicans in Congress who were actually still voting in favor of voting rights. Uh, you know, it may not have been their top priority, but it, but it wasn't their scourge. You know, it wasn't the thing they had to oppose. Uh, and yet, as you point out, that, you know, Democrats failed to get the Freedom to Vote Act, the For the People uh, uh, Act, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. They failed to get it across the, the line. But I am struck by the fact that not a single House Republican voted for any of those bills. And when you look in the legislature in Texas, it is now an article of faith in the Republican Party in Texas to oppose voting rights and to engage in these sort of punitive laws aimed at suppressing voting rights. And, and, and you know, you, you have had kind of a unique perch in this. And I'm just curious, what, what happened to the Republican Party? We can talk about the Democratic Party, but what happened that led them off of the train of saying, look, we can appeal to these uh, you know, this emerging constituent, this emerging electorate, you know, a lot of them are Hispanic. They're not necessarily going to be Democrats. They could find parts of the Republican platform attractive. Like what happened? Yeah, th this is such a good point that you raise. And I remember I'm, I live in El Paso. That's where I'm, I'm broadcasting and talking with you from right now. Um, when George W. Bush was running for reelection as governor of the state of Texas in, in 1998, he was in El Paso all the time. El Paso is the westernmost county in Texas. It's the only county in the mountain time zone. It's hard to get to. You're going to take two flights if you want to come here from most of the rest of the country, even a lot of parts of Texas. Therefore, no statewide candidate really ever showed up in our town. George W. Bush came to this, you know, 84% Mexican American majority community all the time. Really made people in El Paso feel like he cared about them, was listening to them wanted to represent their concerns in the office of the governor. And you know what, Mark, on, on election night in 1998, he won El Paso County, becoming the first Republican to do that in maybe forever. And there hasn't been a Republican who has done it since. So that was one approach to this changing electorate in the state of Texas, a majority minority state, 
um, a state where Latinos now outnumber uh, white Texans, uh, Anglo Texans uh, for for the first time. And then there's what you're seeing now, which is a Republican Party in the sway of Donald Trump, which obviously still contests the results of the 2020 election, is allowing the insurrection attempt first started on the 6th of January 2021 to continue to roll through the halls of the state house where they're imposing um, more and more voting restrictions, more and more anti-democracy measures, really to try to freeze out this growing part of the electorate. You know, there, there are some telling signs of this. If you, uh, on election day in, in November, as it is almost every election day in every November, you'll see lines that stretch seven, eight, nine hours long outside of polling places like the one across from Texas Southern University, one of our historically black colleges in, in Texas. You know, why is that line eight or nine hours long? Well, it's the polling place closures that I mentioned earlier. It's the targeting of young and black voters. And for every person who's able to or willing to wait eight or nine hours, we can imagine how many are working multiple $7.25 an hour jobs, that's our minimum wage here, and don't have the time. How many are caring for elderly parents or their kids or who understandably don't want to suffer the indignity of waiting nine hours to cast right. a ballot in what is supposed to be the world's greatest democracy? That is the, the playbook today from the Republican Party in, in the state of Texas. They're no longer trying to win over significant parts of the state. They're literally trying to shut the door on them to prevent them from participating in our elections. Yeah, you know, you you mentioned something that is like one of my big my big issues, which is that I think that there is a underappreciation in this country of what the line situation is at polls. I mean, essentially, you know, if you look at the data, and there's actually a lot of good data on long lines now because cell phone data can tell you what the lines are, right? Because cell phone carriers know how long a given cell phone is pinging at the cell site closest to the same location data that they use for other purposes they can use for this. And there have been academics who have studied this. And the cell phone companies also have basic racial and age and gender data, right? So they, So it's actually a pretty good data set. And what you find is that Essentially, the only people who wait in long lines in this country are young or black. You know, it's exactly what you said. Like some in some Hispanic areas, some Latino communities are, but like there is not, you simply don't have long lines in majority white communities. There was a, I sued Georgia uh, after their 2020 primary in the six metro counties in Atlanta. Um, so these are counties with very affluent white communities, very uh, uh, very um, uh, uh, affluent black communities, uh, lo lower income communities of all racial categories. Right? These are this is this is Atlanta. These are literally Atlanta. And by the way, these are not necessarily even Republican run counties. These are just you know these are just uh, the counties around Atlanta. And if you were in one of those six counties in the primary in 2020, and you were in a precinct that was 90 percent or more registered voters who were black. Your average wait in line was 51 minutes. If you were in the same six counties, same counties, uh, on the same election day, and you were in a precinct that was 90% or more registered voters were white, you waited an average in line six minutes. Hmm. So six minutes versus 51 minutes explains why Georgia banned food and water for people waiting in line, because the white people aren't waiting in line. <laughs> There's no, if you're waiting like six minutes, you don't have time to drink water or to eat any food. And, you know, those images in Texas, you know, and I forget which election it was, but it was like you said, it was like literally people were waiting till like 4 a.m. If you look at the faces of who those voters are, they are overwhelmingly black or young. And I feel like the media um, and too many, frankly, elite figures, even on the left, will get see those lines and like, look at the enthusiasm. Right. And I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> wait a second. That, this is not a this is not democracy working. This is democracy failing. Right. I always ask the question when I talk to, you know, the audiences that oftentimes I'm talking to, which are which are you know upper income or uh, certainly middle class and above, upper middle class and above, they're oftentimes white audiences or have large white populations, and I always say to them, how long would you wait in line to to vote? You know, forget about the person with the seven with the with the hourly employee. You're salaried. 
You you have health care. You have you have you you're not going to lose your job. How long would you wait? Would you wait two hours? Would you wait four hours? Would you wait till four a.m.? No, you'd walk away. So why is it that you think that that it is fair or appropriate to somehow celebrate the the patriotic democ democratic process for the people who do wait in line? I just I think that there is like a real mis missed understanding of just how discriminatory when you have these poll closings and you have these long lines, it is. Absolutely. And, you know, it's totally natural that when you see these lines, you know, part of you is uh, awestruck and, and maybe even proud of people who are willing to wait, you know, 10, 11 hours in, in order to, to cast a ballot. But that should quickly be overcome by deep shame and embarrassment yeah. that we impose this on, on any of our fellow Americans, and certainly that it's imposed in a targeted way, as you just described, on typically the very young, on communities of, of color, and those that Republican majorities perceive to be a threat to their hold on power. It, it's interesting, 101 years ago, 1923, the Texas state legislature passed the, the white primary law. And perhaps unlike other states of the former Confederacy, where you might have to tell me how many jelly beans are in the jar before I allow you to register to vote or pass a literacy test or recite some part of the state constitution. In Texas, in black and white, it said, if you're black, you, you cannot vote. Texas likes to say the quiet part out loud. And as you know, that, that law stood in one form or other until 1944, till the Smith versus Allwright decision, which nominally struck down segregation and white primary laws, although they continued in, in other forms. You know, today in Texas, it's it's death by a thousand cuts. It's these uh, ballot drop off rules. It's uh, the signature matching rules. It's the um, prescriptive process on assisting a voter with disabilities. It's the polling place closures. It's removing early voting locations from college campuses so that young people right. who right. may not have an automobile can't get to that early voting location. And, and all of this, the most pernicious part of it, I think, from listening to young voters, is that it just creates chaos and confusion in the minds of those who, who want to be able to participate in our democracy and play a role in, in our politics. You know, imagine you're 19 years old. You've just gotten registered to vote here in El Paso. You're the first in your family to ever vote. All you hear in the news about voting is that there are long lines that it's tough, that they're prosecuting people who vote the wrong way. Um, right. You can be forgiven for saying, you know what? I, I don't want to deal with that. I, I don't want to wait in that line. I don't want to be embarrassed and get to the front of the line and realize I'm in the wrong precinct and they're not going to accept my vote. I'm already scared about this. And, and that's exactly what I'm hearing from young people when we go to register them. Like today, I'll be at the El Paso Community College via Verde campus with our other volunteers registering these young 18, 19 20 year olds. These are the kind of things that they're saying to me. And so unfortunately, Mark, it, it has become an incredibly effective strategy on the part of, of the Republican office holders in Texas to create this confusion and to have this blizzard of regulations and laws that, that you know, even very well informed voters sometimes have a very hard time navigating. And then it puts uh, an, an additional strain on those of us who are working to overcome this because sometimes to talk about this publicly is to reinforce the perception that it is tough to vote in Texas. Therefore, uh, more people are less likely to actually cast that ballot because, hey, even O'Rourke is saying it's tough to vote. Why should I do it? So part of what we do in Powered by People, in addition to registering that 19 year old to vote, is we'll ask her separately, hey, would you mind if I stayed in touch with you? Could I get your cell phone number and your email address? And from me personally, whoever the person is that registered that voter, we're going to be their Sherpa over the next four months to make sure they know what the deadlines are, where their nearest early voting location is. Because we're a partisan organization, um, we're able to say, hey, he here are the pro-abortion rights, pro-democracy, uh, pro-gun safety, pro-increase of a minimum wage candidates that are going to be on your ballot. And if you have any questions, you can call or text me anytime uh, of day or night. We've got to take these additional steps in a state like Texas to overcome the single greatest attack on democracy that we've really seen here since 1965. Yeah, so I can't, 
uh, pass up the opportunity while I have you uh, to talk a little bit of politics. Um, you have one of the most exciting Senate races uh, going on in your state, Colin Allred, uh, uh, Congressman, um, uh, is running against uh, uh, Ted Cruz. My favorite line about Ted Cruz, and there are so many, is Al Franken in his book uh, when he wrote when he was a senator said, um, uh, I like Ted Cruz more than uh, most of my colleagues, and I hate Ted Cruz. Uh, he is truly a, a loathed and loathsome human being. Uh, and he's, um, you know, he, he is uh, getting a real run for his money uh, on uh, with uh, Colin Allred. You also have uh, as you mentioned, congressional elections uh, across the state and and uh, state legislative races. So, you know, what is your what is your sense of the electorate <laughs> and the state of politics in Texas as we stand four months from Election Day? Here's why we should care about Texas. Um, as you pointed out, Colin Allred, a, a fantastic member of, of Congress, who won a real upset in 2018, defeating a, a long-term Republican incumbent, just the kind of guy we need to produce another upset in 2024. He, he has the best chance of producing a democratic and pro-democracy win for the US Senate in the country. Um, I mean, it really tells you something about the map, but it also tells you something about Texas that the greatest pickup opportunity is, is right here in this state. And we know because I came within two and a half points of Ted Cruz six years ago that this is totally doable. You know, it's not going to be easy. It's certainly a narrow uphill path, but but we can do this. Three of the tightest House races for control of the United States Congress are also right here in Texas, including a great pickup opportunity in South Texas with Michelle Vallejo. We are uh, can you just about to so the viewers know where roughly in the state is that. Yeah, so the, the Rio Grande Valley, which is uh, the southernmost part of our state, uh, these are communities that are, you know, 95, 98, 99 percent Mexican-American, traditionally have been Democratic strongholds, have, of course, been gerrymandered after 2020 to, to give Republicans a leg up. Uh, Michelle Vallejo, and this is areas around McAllen and, and Brownsville. Right. Um, really kind of the heart and soul of, of Texas, if, if you ask me. She has an excellent chance to win there. And her victory might be a victory, not just for Democrats having control in the House. You and I talked about pro-democracy legislation. If it's going to have a chance under a Democratic president, we need to win the House. And, and her race is incredibly important. We need to win the Senate. It's going to be a tough year to do that. But Colin Allred really offers us our best hope. And, and then there's this. And I know a lot of people think that um, a president, a, a Democrat running for president, winning the electoral college vote in Texas is a pipe dream. But I mentioned earlier, you know, we went from 16 points down to nine points down to five and a half points down with Biden in 2020. All of that without any real national help from the DNC or, or the candidates and campaigns themselves. There are 40 electoral college votes in, in Texas. The day that a Democrat once again wins this state, as Jimmy Carter was the last to do in 76, is the day that a Republican can no longer find a path to the White House. You'd have to flip five yeah. other blue states yeah. to match the Electoral College Hall here. Think it's impossible. Look what happened in Georgia in, in 2020. Uh, that could very well happen here in Texas. But we're going to need not just the people of Texas doing their part. We're going to need folks from outside of Texas who see the value and the importance of these races that you and I are talking about right now to get this done. Yeah, look, this is the this is one of the reasons why, you know, we litigate a lot in Texas. You know, we litigate my law firm and I, I should say, have been active in litigating congressional redistricting cases. In fact, the one's still going, <laughs> there's still litigation going on uh, and also voting rights cases. We have uh, challenged a lot of laws in Texas, both because the laws are really unfair to voters and they are suppressive laws. But also for the reasons you say, which is that, you know, this is this is a competitive state. This is not this is not a one party state. And uh, it is important that if we're going to have free and fair elections, uh, you know, that that we can't look we can't look past a state like Texas, given how its size and importance, as you say, in presidential elections, but also just as a as a state that sets the national agenda. You know, the fact is states like Texas, you know, 
they are they are growing. You know, Texas is going to get bigger yet. Texas is going to get more important uh, from a congressional seat and from an electoral college uh, standpoint in 2030 than it was in 2020. It was bigger in 2020 than it was in 2010, bigger in 2010. And and by the way, correct me if I'm wrong, but almost all of that growth is coming from uh, communities of color. Right. I mean, when you talk about the added congressional seats or the electoral, you know, the the census data, it's almost all coming from uh, communities of color. That's exactly right. And, and again, it helps to explain the, the otherwise inexplicable. Why would the Republican majority work so hard to change our election laws and to produce one of the lowest levels of voter turnout in the nation, given the central role Texas plays in the future of this country? They're doing that because they're afraid of the future. They, they, they see the future breathing down their neck and they recognize it's only a matter of time. They want to extend that time for as long as they can. And without the cover of the Voting Rights Act, uh, you know, gutted in, in 2013, minutes after which, by the way, Texas imposed at the time the strictest voter ID laws in the country, began closing those polling places, the racial gerrymander, all those things we talked about really flows from that. They're, they're really free to attack the people that they purport to serve and represent. And, you know, as, as I think you, you pointed out, there are uh, election and voting rights battles all over the country, and many of them taking place in states that have a, a much closer margin for the presidential ballot in November, and therefore probably getting the lion's share of attention and resources. But uh, again, very grateful to you, to your firm, to your team, and, and the folks who, who support you and others who are doing this work for never losing sight of the importance of Texas, because just as Republicans know it's a matter of time, we know it is a matter of time as well. We also know it's a matter of of effort, and we will make that wait much shorter. We will bring their end in political power much sooner if we keep our eye on the prize and do the work right now. And again, that's why Powered by People is so focused on voter registration. We bring enough of these new pro-democracy Democratic voters onto the rolls, enough of them turn out. That really could be the margin of victory in these important state house, U.S. Congress, U.S. Senate, and ultimately presidential elections. Whether it happens in 24, 26, 28, we really don't know. But much like the voting rights pioneers who preceded us, who knew not when or maybe even if they would get there, they knew they had to try, they put in the work. And because of their service, their sacrifice, their struggle, we live in the world's greatest democracy still. You know, given all of its imperfections and the attacks on it right now, this is this is the best thing going bar none on the planet. And I don't want our generation to be the one that loses it. So, you know, no pressure, folks who are watching this, but we've really got to come through at this moment of truth. So I, I got to ask you a question before we go. You have had a fascinating uh, journey in and out of politics. You know, you were a, a, uh, a accomplished musician. You, you look like uh, you might you might go the direction of being a, a member of a band. Uh, you, as far as I, where I read, you worked for a moving company. Uh, you, you did moving. Uh, you worked for an internet company. You were then a successful businessman. Then you decided to go to Congress. And normally I ask people, why did you decide to get into politics? But the question for you is then you got into politics and then, you know, you did something that very few house members do, which is you actually gave up your house. You know, I assume it was a relatively safe seat uh, that you could have spent, uh, you know, a lifetime in. Uh, and and you have sort of been in and out of the political process, but also in civil society, in uh, the nonprofit space. You mentioned Powered by People, which is a great organization that you're head now. And I, I'm, just, I'm just fascinated by kind of how you see sort of getting into politics and out of politics and like serving in all of these different ways and also just being like a normal person. Now, I'm not trying to disrespect politicians, but like having done these other parts of your life, like how do you think of government service? Like how do you think about when you want to be in the political arena and when not to be in the political arena? When uh, Senator Obama was running in 2008 for the nomination, I, I like tens of millions of other Americans was totally captivated, inspired. First politician in, in my life, uh, 
outside of some local politicians like Senator Elliot Shapley and Mayor Ray Caballero here in, in El Paso, but first national politician who, who really captured my imagination, inspired the hell out of me. I, I just, I would walk through walls for that guy. And I, and I did my best, you know, knocking on doors, donating. Uh, we had a Texas two-step at the time in, in 08 during our primary right. process, both a caucus and a primary. You know, I worked the caucus here in Sunset Heights uh, for, for Senator Obama. And I just remember when he clinched the nomination and after that, when he won the presidency, the relief that I felt, you know, my, my job is over. I've, I've done my part. Now, Barack Obama is going to save all of us and we can just sit back and watch. You know, with, with the value of hindsight, I, I realized actually he needed us more after he won than, than before he won. And, you know, we saw it in, in 2010 and the aftermath of that, the, the attacks on him personally, on his administration, and then ultimately to the, the life's work that you've led to, to our democracy, these attacks on our democracy that really intensified during his time in office. And I think there was just really an epiphany for me. Um, I, I woke up and realized, you know, democracy, the, the price for participation and for keeping the the last best hope of earth, as Lincoln put it, is just uh, continuous vigilance and constant action. And so whether I was a candidate or an office holder or a volunteer, as I am now, I, I've just I've just got to be involved as all of us do. This is not a sport. It, it is not a, a pastime or a hobby for a certain class of people, the political class or the elites or whatever someone would, would like to, to, to describe those who are involved in politics. If you live in America, all 330 million plus of us, um, there, there's very little that is asked of us relative to those who came before, the hundreds of thousands who gave their lives to end slavery, um, those who landed on the beaches 80 years ago in, in Normandy to fight fascism abroad and preserve democracy here at home, those in, in the civil and voting rights battles who, who literally gave their lives so that we could achieve a true multiracial democracy. All that's being asked of us, not to give our lives, not, not to go in, into battle, um, but to register, to vote, and to engage with our fellow citizens about how important this election is. And yes, that means knocking on doors. And yes, it means standing on college campuses and asking young people if they're registered to vote and then helping them through that process if they're not, you know, is it easy? No, um, but it, it the, the sacrifice pales in comparison to what's preceded us. And, and it is nothing compared to what our future would be without a democracy. And that's very possible if we don't do all that we can with what we have, where we are right now. And so that's, that's I guess, my, you know, philosophy and, and what motivates me. And that's going to be my path for the, the rest of my time on this planet. You know, I, I feel so lucky to be in this country. Um, I want to make sure that we preserve what's so special about it for my kids and the generations who follow them. And it's not going to save itself. And, and again, you know, I think there are people like you who, who stand out for folks who understand how late the hour is who are fighting with everything they can and literally fighting on every front. And I know that that's controversial. I know not everyone wants us to be, you know, fighting everywhere. But when, when we don't fight for everyone and we don't fight everywhere, what are we telling those people who then don't have an advocate, don't have a champion, uh, that they don't matter, that they're forgotten to us, that they shouldn't even try? And so we really got to be in, in the work of inspiring one another, helping one another, supporting each other, and just getting out there and doing the work. Well, and thank you so much for the kind words and everything um, you are doing. I hope everyone uh, goes to Powered by People and supports it in every way they can. If you can contribute, please do so. It is really one of the most important organizations for people who ask me, what can you do to help? This is what you can do to help. You can support uh, Beto O'Rourke and his uh, efforts. Um, he is truly one of the, the, the great figures for democracy in American politics today. You know, I am struck 
by something else that uh, then candidate Obama said uh, when asked why he was running in 2008. He said, I am closer to normal now than I will ever be. I still have oh. student loans. I, I deal with, I, I, I go to the grocery store. And every time I think of, of you and I see you, uh, I think this is someone who, you know, they, you have found every way to contribute to our society. And you are, you understand what the challenges are in a way that is viscerally connected to the to to the people who we are all here to help serve and to protect so thank you very much for being on with me today thank you mark i really 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 am grateful for the work that you're doing and for having me on thank you thanks for watching defending democracy to stay up to date on the latest voting rights news make sure you're subscribed to our free daily and weekly newsletters we'll see you next time <laughs>